We are a justice-making, truth-seeking people. We gather as a community of believers and seekers. We share a reverence for the mystery of life. We are building the beloved community. Come, let us worship together.
As frozen earth holds the determined seed, this sacred space holds our weariness, our worry, our laughter, and our celebration. Let us bring seed and soul into the light of thought, the warmth of community, and the hope of love. Let us see together, hear together, love together. Let us worship. Please join in singing our first hymn this morning, the first Noel. Stand as you're willing and able. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages the life of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas, environmental action, income equality, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. This, plate, this month's plate collection recipient is Samaritas, a nonprofit whose services include resettlement of refugees. Through its Afghan refugee network, Samaritas is seeking our help to resettle 350 adults and children who were evacuated from Afghanistan and are completing the US screening process most of them fled with little more than the clothes on their back and now seek protection and a chance to become productive members of our Michigan communities. Let us support their settlement and help make our state a welcoming new home.
Let there be an offering of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. Ushers, please come forward. Okay. Sorry, it's my bad. It's okay, it's okay. You are doing great. You are doing great. We are a church of open hands, loving hearts, and open minds. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the service of our congregation and ourselves to its service. Instead of religious education classes today, the Religious Education Council and the sixth through 12th grade youth are leading our K through five kids in Candy Cane Sunday activities. Uh, this is a chance for everyone in the RE program and across to have fun and while working on projects that benefit the whole BUC community. So after our uh, Time for All Ages, which is recorded today, everybody who is uh, in here that shouldn't be in here, young people, 12 and under will be dismissed and Doug Body will meet you at the back to take you to your classes. Everybody else has to stay, okay? But K okay, through 12. This morning's Time for All Ages is based on an Aesop's fable called The Ant and the Grasshopper. One summer's day, a grasshopper was laying down in a field, chirping and singing. Ant passed by, struggling with the weight of a kernel of corn she was taking to the nest. Why not come sing with me, said grasshopper. You are working much too hard. I am helping to store food for the winter, said Ant. You should be doing this too, since there won't be anything to eat once it gets cold and the snow falls. I disagree, said Grasshopper. The sun is out and it's time for me to rest and sing. Ant shook her head and continued on her way, carrying the heavy kernel of corn. When winter came, food did indeed become very scarce and Grasshopper soon found himself hungry and cold. Ant was warm and well-fed, though admittedly a little lonely. Poor Grasshopper came one day to the door of Ant's house, shivering so badly he could hardly knock. Ant answered the door and looked at poor hungry Grasshopper. Please, Grasshopper begged, it's so cold out here and I am starving. There's no food anymore. Ant sighed. Well, maybe you shouldn't have laid around doing nothing all summer. Doing nothing? exclaimed Grasshopper. Oh, let's make a deal. Share your food with me, and I will show you the magic of laying around. Ant was doubtful, but she let Grasshopper in and gave him some of her food. When he was finished eating, Grasshopper laid on the couch and began to sing. It was a calm, soothing tune, and soon Ant found herself smiling and relaxing into her chair. She began to realize just how stressed she had been all summer, and what a relief it was to sit down and do nothing. So all through that long, cold winter, Grasshopper and Ant shared food, songs, and rest, and it was good. For you shall go out in joy, for you shall go out in joy. We went totally out of order, so I don't, yeah, there we go. Start off with a, a joy for our, our text. Thank you <laughs> for keeping up with that. It was totally my fault. Andrea wants to let you know that that was totally my fault. <laughs> <laughs> 
We come now to the time in our service that we set aside for prayer and reflection, spiritual practice. Uh, we do begin with the sharing of those joys and sorrows. We start off this morning by sharing a sorrow with Kelly Taylor. Kelly tells us, uh, my uncle passed away on, t on Thursday. My aunt is doing well, but could use some thoughts and prayers. This morning, we also celebrate with our congregation. We have a, a celebration for the 95th birthday of Helen Spangler. This continues, our family will gather locally, but have Zoom attendees of children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren across the country. Happy 95th, Helen. We have a note of concern from Cheryl Shuttle. Cheryl shares that my husband, Jim, is at home recovering from prostate cancer surgery. Please send healing thoughts his way. And one final and thorough note of joy, uh, Pat Schwing, has let us know, and we share in her joy that they were surrounded, she and Pat and Dick were surrounded by immediate family in the celebration of their 50th anniversary on Saturday. <laughs> on the last Sunday of the month, it is our tradition to light memorial candles for our beloved dead. This is not the last Sunday of the month, but we felt this was the appropriate Sunday for this practice. If you would like to come forward to light a candle, I invite you to do so. I remind you to please light the candle from the back of the, the bowl forward. We'll begin with a, a candle lit for those joining us on Zoom and those who are unable to come forward or who do not wish so because of the cameras.
We gather this morning in the presence of each other and in the holy. We gather here out of love and concern for each other. We're here this day. We're here many days in an effort to bring more hope and joy into our lives and therefore into the world during this time of excessive busyness. Let us take time to rest and to notice what is happening around us. Let's take comfort and joy in one another and in the mystery of life, human connection. I invite you now to bring to mind a beloved, somebody who you bring on your heart this morning, someone who you might hold in concern, someone who you might be celebrating with. I invite you now to share that person's name aloud. We hold these beloved together as a community as we hold each other together as a community. We keep in mind the joys and the sorrows that are too dear to share at this time, knowing that we know each other well, but we can never know each other's burdens and each other's true joys. And yet, we find comfort, and we find love, and we find joy together. May it be so. Amen. Sing with me. For One Who Is Exhausted, A Blessing by John O'Donohue. When the rhythm of the heart becomes hectic, time takes on the strain until it breaks, then all the unattended stress on the mind like an endless increasing weight, the light in the mind becomes dim. Things you could take in stride before now become laborsome events of will. Weariness invades your spirit. Gravity begins falling inside you, dragging down every bone. The tide you never valued has gone out, and you are marooned on unsure ground. Something within you has closed down, and you cannot push yourself back to life. You have been forced to enter empty time. The desire that drove you has relinquished. There's nothing else to do now but rest and patiently learn to receive the self you have forsaken in the race of days. At first, your thinking will darken and sadness will take over like listless weather. The flow of unwept tears will frighten you. 
You have traveled too fast over false ground. Now your soul has come to take you back. Take refuge in your senses. Open up to the small miracles you rushed through. Become inclined to watch the way of the rain when it falls slow and free. Imitate the habit of twilight, taking time to open the well of color that fosters the brightness of day. Draw alongside the silence of stone until its calmness can claim you. Be excessively gentle with yourself. Stay clear of those vexed in spirit. Learn to linger around someone of ease who feels they have all the time in the world. Gradually, you will return to yourself, having learned a new respect for your heart and the joy that dwells far within slow time. Our second reading is from the introduction of a book titled The Sabbath, written by Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel in 1951. Technical civilization is man's conquest of space. It is a triumph frequently achieved by sacrificing an essential ingredient in existence, namely time. In technical civilization, we expand time to gain space. To enhance our power in the world of space is our main objective. Yet to have more does not mean to be more. The power we attain in the world of space terminates abruptly at the borderline of time. But time is the heart of existence. To gain control of the world of space is certainly one of our tasks. The danger begins when, in gaining power in the realm of space, we forfeit all aspirations in the realm of time. There is a realm of time where the goal is not to have, but to be, not to own, but to give, not to control, but to share, not to subdue, but to be in accord. Life goes wrong when the control of space, the acquisition of things of space, becomes our sole concern. Nothing is more useful than power, nothing more frightful. We have often suffered from degradation by poverty. Now we are threatened with degrega degradation through power. There is happiness in the love of labor. There is misery in the love of gain. Many hearts and pitchers are broken at the fountain of profit. Selling himself into slavery of things, man becomes a utensil that is broken at that fountain.
During these late days of December, we face a paradox. It's not actually a paradox, it's actually a conflict between the natural world and our culture, but both feel immutable, so we'll call it a paradox. On one hand, the lessened light and the cold weather impact us emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Our natural state is to be introspective. We look back on the year that was, we plan for the year ahead. In pre-Christian, earth-based tradition, so-called paganism, this natural rhythm is honored by time spent indoors with loved ones telling stories, working on handicrafts, mending and preparing for that next year, being introspective during the time of year that leads to introspection. In our culture, heavily influenced by Christianity, particularly Calvinism, however, is at odds with this natural response to our environmental conditions. We have absolutely packed this time of year. We do spend time with loved ones and we tend to stay indoors, or I do. But we have built a habit out of letting the month of December just completely get away from us. We fill our time with shopping, baking, decorating, card writing, gift wrapping, traffic sitting, all of the things that we know. And we do these things so that we can enjoy our time together and the expressions of love and gratitude for our loved ones, allegedly, when we get so busy with those good intentions that it takes a toll. When we're too tired, we miss out on things. We can't be present to what is happening around us because we're thinking about something else, either what we're supposed to be doing or the thing we're supposed to be doing next. It is a great irony that we do all of those things to enjoy spending time with the people that we love and then we put ourselves at risk of not being able to be fully present for that time and to enjoy that time. We risk missing out on what's really happening in the holiday season every year, but especially this year. It's been almost 24 straight months of stress. We have coped with ever-changing safety guidelines, looming threats to our health and safety, a recalcitrant group of people who refuse to take the most basic safety precautions. And it's been a lot. And we're tired. We need the connection and the joy of the holiday season perhaps more than ever this year. And we arrive here with a higher than usual likelihood to miss it because we are exhausted. Humans need rest. And as Unitarian Universalists, we understand all human needs to be sacred. The Unitarian Universalist principle that we're exploring this month is our third principle, acceptance of each other and encouragement to spiritual development in our congregations. Honoring our need for rest is a spiritual practice. What makes it spiritual is that you do it for the purpose of connection with yourself and the wider experience of life. What makes it a practice is that you do it regularly and with intent. Crashing out on your couch at 8.30 at night because you've been working since 7 a.m. is not a spiritual practice, <laughs> nor is it really rest. That is your body's way of letting you know that your work-life balance is out of whack. Rest as a spiritual practice is most often associated with Judaism. And Rabbi Heschel wrote a book on the subject that I shared from earlier. It is aptly titled, The Sabbath. Heschel was a contemporary of Martin Luther King Jr. He was a voice of Jewish liberalism. Now, before we go any further, I want to be very clear that what we're talking about this morning is the non-sectarian practice of spiritual rest, sacred rest. We need to be thoughtful in how we use the word Sabbath. It is a religious term with a specific meaning, and we have to be careful not to co-opt it for our own use. We have a lot to learn about the practice of, of sacred rest from Sabbath, but we must not claim it for our own. 
it is available to us, this concept of spiritual practice of rest. But when you use, talk about sacred rest, where we don't have the same specific resonance as Jews talking about Sabbath. And again, we do have a lot to learn from that practice. And in his book, Heschel describes the human experience as existing in the realm of space and the realm of time. I've read enough Neil deGrasse Tyson to know that space and time are essentially the same thing. And in the excerpt that I shared earlier and later on the book, Heschel also acknowledges that the two are related, but he was a rabbi writing in the mid 20th century, not a present day physicist. So when Heschel uses the concepts of space and time, he uses the term space to refer to the material world, the world that we can manipulate. And specifically, he's talking about the world in which humanity often hopes to control or dominate. In our modern lives, which Heschel calls technical civilization, we spend practically all of our time in the realm of space, the realm of the material. And the Sabbath is a reprieve from the realm of space. It resides in the realm of time, which is free from the demands of the material realm. The Sabbath then is an opportunity to stop doing and to just be. Rest is not a reward for labor, nor is it something that we do in preparation for labor. Heschel is clear later in the book that the purpose of Sabbath is not to rest in order to accomplish more during the week, but because we are designed to rest. It is meaningful contact with the realm of time in a society that is obsessed with the realm of space. Rest is only related to labor and as much as they are both a part of the human experience. Labor is for the realm of space, rest is for the realm of time. Both are necessary for the human experience and therefore sacred and they should be treated as such. We rest because it is part of the human experience and we are entitled to it, not because it makes us better at labor. This is a radical concept in our culture. We measure worth in terms of wealth. We literally say someone has done well for themselves when they have a lot of money. It has been ingrained in American culture from the beginning. Our spiritual ancestors, the Puritans, were strict Calvinists. Just take a moment, you use come from Calvinists. <laughs> Historical Calvinists believed that God's favor was reserved for a chosen few, the elect. And furthermore, the outward sign of God's favor was physical comfort, including wealth. For the Puritans, piety equaled prosperity and anything else was a symptom of faithlessness. A hundred or years, uh, hundreds or so years after the Puritans came to this continent, the Calvinist work ethic became a blunt tool of the Industrial Revolution. Equating wealth with personal piety became particularly gruesome. When having money is understood as a sign of God's favor, and that favor is won solely through personal piety, people can and will do anything in the name of acquisition and then be able to justify it, including commodifying time and people. When time and people are a commodity, rest is a liability. The way to motivate people in that system is to convince them that rest is immoral, that rest is a sin. American culture is still suspicious of rest, even disparaging toward it. We are shamed for a basic human need, something is inherently wrong with who we inherently are as a species. It means that human life is being devalued in favor of something else when who we are naturally is considered wrong. We lose and something else wins. 
and in this case, profit, is being valued over human life. And we can resist participating in that system by taking a positive attitude towards rest, the magic of laying around, or even being a thoughtful, well-boundaried spiritual practice of rest. As the pandemic has ground us down and worn on, our stress levels have been increased beyond what we previously understood to be possible. And with that, so has our need for rest. All of us are working on reserve energy and that is running very, very low. I've spoken with a lot of people who feel guilty about being exhausted, needing to slow down. That, that thing is still with us, that it's wrong somehow to be tired. All of us feel exhausted and we need to slow down. That's okay. But it feels awful to do that because most of us have been programmed to measure our worth based on productivity. That isn't sustainable and it is not the truth. Truth is that all people have inherent worth and dignity. It is not earned, nor is it proven through labor, nor is it measured by stress or wealth or any other outward sign. It's just there, it's just inherent. We don't prove it, it just is. We're not Calvinists, we left that a long time ago, centuries ago. But we as Unitarian Universalists, we've, we've kept that part of it. It's part of the country, it's part of the culture. Nothing we do or own is an indication of our value, of our worth. I want you to hear me say this. We cannot do as much as we used to do before the pandemic, and frankly, we did too much before the pandemic anyways, and we should not be expected to be doing as much as we once did. When everything has changed and everything has gotten so much harder, it is unreasonable and it is unkind to expect work outputs to remain the same. We have to accept the truth that when we do less, we do not become less. In fact, it's the opposite. When we push ourselves beyond what is reasonable, we miss out on the opportunities to enjoy the important moments of our lives. We diminish our lives. And as hard as it might be to accept that we can't do as much as we used to, a movement has sprung up around this truth. The phrase, People over productivity has become common. It's still a somewhat radical statement and it may not be widely embraced, but it rings true, doesn't it? People over productivity. People mean more than things. People are more than achievements, and paychecks and stuff. People mean more than profit. If we, Unitarian Universalists, if we support the dignity and worth of every person, that means we have to value rest, our own and that of others. And that means we have to be willing to accept some inconveniences that arise from lower productivity in favor of supporting each other's humanity. We need to be okay with people doing less, including ourselves. We can't get everything that we want the way we want it when we want it, the way that we've grown accustomed to. And we've seen what some have called a, a labor shortage. I would reframe that as a labor movement. People are no longer content to work for a wage that doesn't support them and their dependents. The minimum wage in the state of Michigan nets around $20,000 a year, or 40 hour a week job. It might be 24,000, it's not enough. People are no longer willing to work for that. And that's a good thing. 
even if it means that I can't go in the lobby of Starbucks to get my caffeine to do more than I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I don't know who needs to hear this, and maybe we all do, but you have permission to rest this holiday season. You have permission to rest, period, but especially right now. Rest is a human need. All human needs are sacred. Humans are sacred. Our needs are sacred. All of us have traditions and aspirations for this time of year. Maybe this is the year to consider revising some of those. There's a lot of pressure to have it be the same every year or even better, bigger and better every year, the way we think it was a long time ago. It was never that way. And it's certainly not that way this year. We do not have to become more. We do not have to do more. And in fact, when we do more, we become less. We balance that checkbook against our own bodies and against our lives. Heschel calls this embezzlement of one's own life. Having the, the perfect holiday memory is not worth it if we are so tired to actually remember anything except for how tired we were. Do any of you even remember last Christmas? A couple of things. It's not gonna be like that next year either. I mean, it will be like that next year either. We're not gonna look back and have all these memories of exactly the way everything was because everything's a blur because we're exhausted. We can let go of the idea of trying to make this one to remember because we're not going to remember it. Just <laughs> let it go. As we come to these last two frenzied weeks of the year, let's find a time for that more natural pace of introspection. Let's let go of that Calvinist drive to be bigger, faster, stronger. It's not true. It was never true. It's just an idea and not, not a right idea and frankly, not a very good idea. This year, let's do something radical. Let's practice doing less. Let's practice being instead of doing. May it be so. Will you please relaxedly and fully sing out our last <laughs> hymn, Stand as you're willing and able. <laughs> Shall see glory to 
Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. Amen. <laughs>